right, we are live, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for another Science Sunday Hangout on Air, uh, this one for ferreting out the truth. I'm Scott Lewis from KnowTheCosmos.com, and my co-host, Boudini, will be here introducing Hi. everyone. Um, we have um, Tommy joining us, and Vincent, and Will, and I'll let you guys introduce yourself. Hi, my name's uh, Tommy Long. I am an evolutionary parasitologist from University of New England, Australia. Hey everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello. I'm a professor of virology at Columbia University and host of the science show This Week in Virology. Hi, I'm Will McEwen. I'm a virologist from the Medical Research Council Laboratory of Molecular Biology, which is in Cambridge, UK. Um, and I'm joining you from Honolulu, where I'm at a conference, the American Association of Immunologists, this weekend. Awesome. And yeah, Will and I are both in Hawaii, but on different islands right now. <laughs> That's right. So let's start things off by um, talking about what this ferret flu was. What's the, what was the experiment that the Dutch um, virologist Ron Fouchier did? And Vincent, you've written quite a lot about this. Maybe you can explain um, what started all this back in 2001. 2011. <laughs> yeah, 2011, sorry. Um, so the issue here is avian influenza H5N1, which uh, is quite a lethal virus in birds and occasionally infects people, uh, but has not yet been able to transmit from person to person. And of course, that's what makes flu a big killer when it can go from one person to another by aerosol. So the object of the work done by Fouchier and also Kawaoka at, at uh, Madison, Wisconsin, was to figure out what could make uh, H5N1 aerosol transmissible. And of course, to do that, you need to use an animal model. So they selected ferrets uh, because they have a variety of properties that make them amenable. They can be aerosol infected. They have respiratory tracts that are very similar to those of humans. They develop, you know, the, the sneezing and coughing and sniffles and all that associated with flu, and they make a good immune response to it. But the two groups took a different approach to answering this question. Fouché took an H5N1 virus, all right, right out of birds, and he introduced some amino acid changes in the hemagglutinin of the virus. Now that's the protein on the surface of the particle that attaches to cell receptors. So is that what the H stands for? for your... Yeah, so the H5 is hemagglutinin or okay. HA, right? So it's shortened in the H5. And uh, it, it, it birds typically the HA binds to a different sialic acid from human strains of influenza, though the bird viruses like to bind to what we call alpha-2-3 linked sialic acid. It's just it's a carbohydrate at the end of a protein, but it, it's chemically different from uh, human receptors, which are alpha-2-6. So Fouché changed the HA to allow this H5N1 virus to recognize human receptors. And when you do that and you, and you put it into ferrets, it replicates not very well. So Fouché introduced another mutation, this time in one of the proteins of the virus that helps the virus replicate its RNA. And that allowed the virus to replicate a little better. And when he recovered viruses from those ferrets, he found a couple of additional changes. Uh, and then when he put them all together, um, it's, it's one, two, three, four, five amino acid changes, all in the hemagglutinin protein of this H5N1 virus, was able to infect ferrets, and they could transmit it by aerosol to ferrets in another cage in a different part of the room. Now, that infection in those ferrets is not lethal. Those ferrets get sick, they develop influenza, but they don't die. So in making these modifications, that has changed the lethality of the virus. Now, the Kawaoka approach was very different. They took just the gene encoding the H5HA, and they put it into a, a 2009 H1N1 pandemic strain. This is a human strain that we know transmits very well from person to person. And he said, if we replace the hemagglutin in the H1 with the H5, can we get this to transmit in ferrets? Uh, so he also introduced a couple of amino acid changes in the H5HA to allow it to bind human receptors. Uh, and then when he put it into ferrets, he again had to select for uh, viruses that could replicate better in ferrets. And he ended up uh, with um, 
four H five HA mutations, which would allow the virus to pass by by aerosol from ferret to ferret, but again, not lethal. So we have two different approaches. We have mutations in just one of the genes of the H5 virus that now allow it to transmit by aerosol. And this allows us to understand the mechanism of that. And since then, there have been some interesting papers looking at the structure of these adapted H5 HAs. Really interesting stuff. But the idea that these are very dangerous viruses, I think, was, was probably a miscommunication initially. Anyway, so that's the science behind this. So it the research that they're doing, it's not just because they're bored and have nothing else to do besides playing around with viruses to make them contaminate humans. There's there's a reason behind doing this, is that right? Absolutely. The, the reason is to understand why uh, these viruses can't transmit by aerosol in a mammal. I mean, of course, you can't do it in people, obviously, so you pick something else, you, you get some information, uh, and you, and then you go from there to figure out how it's working. But yes, you're absolutely right. There is a very precise scientific question behind these experiments. Very good. Thank you. I mean, that, it's there's a lot of a lot of terminology that goes on that we're not necessarily familiar with. And when, sure. you know, I am not a biologist, so I I read some of these things, and I have to do a lot of research on my own to try to figure out what you're, you know what we're talking about when I'm seeing these headlines coming out, and I know the, the general public doesn't necessarily have the time. I luckily have sure. enough time to go through and find sources to try to figure out what's going on. So getting a, a better understanding of the science that's going on, the, the mechanisms in play, and what they're actually looking for is extremely important. And being able to communicate that easily is very important too, which is why we turn to the media, who is supposed to be giving us this, this pertinent information and helping us make better informed decisions. Well, unfortunately, this this story, I mean, the summary I gave you is so full of jargon that, and I didn't have time to explain right. it, you know, a lay person would, would be hopeless trying to understand it. And the press is basically a lay press. Most of them don't have science training. So it's very, very, very difficult. And that's why I think virologists need to try and communicate this stuff. And I do a lot of it, but uh, others have to join in as well and you know eventually you do convert people they say oh I understand now because the, yeah. the press can't do that yeah so one of the things that um, might sound strange to people who aren't familiar with virology is why ferrets why do you have to work on influenza research with ferrets and maybe will you can explain that because you work on influenza I, you know, I, I'm not actually a, a flu virologist, although I do work with other viruses. Um, okay. But yeah, it, it does, it does on the face of it, sound like a pretty eccentric choice to choose a ferret. Yeah. Um, biologists, when we can, we use mice because there's a lot of reagents available for mice um, and we can do a lot more genetics in mice, so there's uh, genetic knockouts available. Um, yeah. But the problem with infecting mice with flu um, is that a lot of the human strains don't actually uh, replicate that well um, and they also don't get the same pathological symptoms. They don't uh, have the sneeze reflex, for instance, so transmission studies are a lot harder in mice. Um, so it's been known for a while that uh, ferrets make quite a good model for, um, for flu um, they have the same kind of distribution of the um, alpha alpha 2,6 sialic acid that Vincent was talking about um, in the upper respiratory tract, which um, gives them uh, less the virus transmit. So we're, we're, we're more confident when we see something in, uh, when we see an effect in um, ferrets that it's more likely to, to uh, be relevant to human infection. So they're closer um, I, to humans than mice would be? Well, then, no. They're, okay. they're actually caniforms, so they're um, more related to dogs. They're, um, so they're, they're equally distantly um, related okay. in, 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 in terms of the phylogenies. But um, just through the happenstance of the way evolution works, they, they have a sneeze reflex, for instance, um, right. which is very important for, for studying the transmission. Okay. I think it's important to, to emphasize the word that Will used, model. 
They're a model yeah. for flu, and they are in yeah. no way predictive. I think in 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 infection, when you study a virus, a bacterium, any kind of infectious agent, you don't ever assume that what you find in an animal model is predictive for what will happen in people. It will help Absolutely. you understand maybe what happens in people. But one of the big problems I saw with this H5N1 controversy was that the press was saying that whatever happened in ferrets would, would for sure happen in people. And yeah. that's simply not true. As you would know, when you test drugs, for example, or vaccines in a pharmaceutical company, you, you test them in animals. But you always have to do a clinical trial to make sure that what you found uh, works in people. And it's the same thing with these kinds of animal models as well. Now, with yeah. the animal model of the ferret, you know, we brought up earlier that it's because of the sneezing. Is there any other reason? Because you know, we're obviously looking at aerosol transmission, and so sneezing is a great way for releasing things into the air. Are there any other advantages for having ferrets over mice besides that? Well, um, hey, for, 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 go ahead, Will. No, no, you, oh, okay. Well, yeah, uh, for instance, they, they, they also get fevers um, quite quickly after infection, um, which is very similar to humans. Um, they get runny noses, um, this kind of thing, which, which is a lot harder to see in the mice. And the guinea pigs as well, actually, um, which um, have been used as well. Um, you, you don't get the same kind of symptoms. You know, it's worth pointing out that uh, you would think that a that a non-human primate would be a good model for flu, right? Because they're 99% human. But it turns out that chimps are terrible models for studying flu. You have to put the virus intratracheally into the lung to get a good uh, infection. So, you know, relatedness of species doesn't really help you. Um, for human studies, the best is to observe what's going out there in humans. Tommy, you've been so quiet. Oh, well, so I'm just quiet. waiting for my opportunity to talk. talk. I know you can talk. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm not exactly a virologist, so I'm just waiting for like my, my window when I should um, talk. And seeing how you cued me, uh, I guess I might... Um, a lot of these uh, experiments, which uh, involves different animal models, um, I, it's at this point that I want to talk a little bit about the host specificity which is a fundamental property of all parasites, uh, whether they are you know, the usual worms or lice, or whether they're microparasites, such as bacteria or viruses. So this means that uh, every single parasite can only infect a specific uh, set of hosts. And this particular set of hosts that it can infect is also known as this host range. So some parasites are very specific, they can only infect one specific species of host or even a, a particular population of that species. You have other parasites that can infect a wide range of many different species of hosts. But even for the parasites that can infect many different species of hosts, they might perform differently on those species. So they might uh, inflict more pathology on one particular species, whereas in another it's more benign. And often this kind of property of whether it can establish on one host or and not another host is something that's fundamental to the mechanism through which it infects that particular host. So for example, uh, just moving away from viruses, uh, there's a particular group of tapeworm called the tetraphylidians, which are specialists on sharks and rays. And they attach onto the intestinal wall of the host using an attachment organ called scolex. And the skull legs of these groups of tapeworms are extremely intricate. Uh, some of them look like flowers, some of them look like four-leaf clovers. In fact, uh, the name tetraphylidians means tetra means four, phyllodes yeah. mean leaves or branch. And so uh, they are very, very intricate and specialized because they can only infect a specific species of host. And if we transfer that tapeworm onto another different species, it's like a lock and key mechanism. The key doesn't go into a lock, even if it looks very similar, but if it isn't yeah. almost exactly the same, it wouldn't go in. Uh, yeah, the yeah. same way, it, it also applies to external parasites as well. So there are specific, uh, some species of lice called chewing lice that infect both uh, birds and mammals. And the chewing lice that infects mammals, they have a special uh, slot or groove that runs down the center of the head called rostral groove. And they use this kind of like a peg on a clothesline that fit right. the hair shaft onto there. So it allows them to grip onto the hair shaft. 
and they're highly host specific. They have one species of lice that can only affect one species of host. And the reason for that is that if you transfer that louse onto a different host, if the hair shaft is too thick, then it can't get a good grip onto the hair shaft and it can't establish itself. Wow. And conversely, if you transfer it onto different animals that have thinner hair, then the rostral group won't be able to get a good grip onto that host animal. So that's yeah. how these particular mechanism through which the parasite used to infect and become established onto the host, in turn also limits what kind of host that infects. And this would also apply to microparasites such as bacteria and viruses. And the property of the hemagglutinin protein that is found on the surface of influenza virus would also determine what kind of host it can infect, but it would also limit what kind of host it can infect as well. So if it can infect ferret, that does not necessarily mean that it can infect humans. Okay. So um, what determines which is the best host that an influenza strain can infect, zooming back into viruses? Is there something where a certain influenza flu is like, okay, birds are no good, pigs are no good, but humans are yummy. How does that work? <laughs> Well, it's, it's uh, one of the first levels that we think of is getting into a cell. Viruses have to get inside, yeah. so they have to latch onto a receptor on the surface of the cell. So that's okay. a huge determinant of tropism. The virus I work with, uh, poliovirus, only infects humans because they're the only species that have a receptor. And if it were so simple for flu, we wouldn't worry about any of this. It would just be an exclusively human infection. But here in the case of flu, it's not just the receptor, it's beyond the receptor once the virus gets into cells. Other genes make a difference and it really depends on what the host that you're looking at. It could be a ferret, it could be a mouse, a guinea pig and people are trying to sort all this out. Um, the, real, the real answer is what happens in people and that, as I yeah. said, is hard to do. So you always have to make associations or inferrals from what you see out there in nature. Um, one of the cool things happening now maybe not so cool, this new H7N9 uh, avian virus that has emerged in China. So far, it doesn't have the ability to transmit among humans. Now, if it should acquire that property, and I don't think there's any reason to assume it will or won't, but if it should acquire it, we'll be able to see the before and after and say, aha, in people, this is what you need to transmit. But right. those kinds yeah. of opportunities are pretty rare, you know. That's the problem. So. What happens, because one thing that people do talk about a lot is how viruses mutate and influenza A, you get lots of different viruses in one cell. What exactly happens to the virus when there's two different types of virus in one cell? So what the, the, the genetic mean? information of the virus, of influenza virus, is in pieces. It's in eight different pieces. And if different influenza viruses infect the cell, and that can happen if an animal is multiply infected, uh, all those eight pieces uh, mix together and the new viruses that are produced are, are really a sample of the eight from either virus and this is called reassortment. So not a lot of viruses do that, but it's very efficient and that's one of the main reasons we worry about influenza, new viruses emerging because all these animals out there, birds and, and other sorts of animals can be infected with multiple strains and, and new viruses can emerge. The H7N9 in China is a triple reassortant. It's got genes from viruses that infect three different kinds of birds. So flu is unique because it can do this. And on top of all we the other mechanisms. I have an image for you um, that we actually pulled from your blog that might help um, explain this. Concept. That's right. This yeah. is actually, this is amazingly an image from my thesis, which was so many okay. years ago that none of you were probably even born at the time. <laughs> but this shows you two different influenza viruses. They're labeled L and M, and they're distinguished by the color of their uh, eight segments. So this virus is enveloped, and it has uh, glycoproteins in the envelope. And you can see the main one here, the purplish one, uh, is uh, hemagglutinin, which we've talked about a little. So you see eight pieces of RNA. And if you co-infect the cell with these two viruses, all those eight pieces are all mixed up uh, in the cell. So the new viruses that are made can, e can look like either parent, in this case L or M, or you can see this one, R3, on the right, has one red RNA from the L parent and the rest of the genome from the others. And this is a very, very high frequency event. And that is one of the reasons why 
uh, influenza viruses are such a worry. There's so many different sorts of uh, viruses out there and they can really combine and uh, produce all sorts of, of new progeny this way. So that's called reassortment. And is this what happened in 2009 with the swine flu pandemic? Yeah, so that was a, a reassortment of many different uh, swine and human and avian viruses and it was something that was probably, ah, voila, there you go, something that was going on for years. So here we have our 2009 uh, human H H1N1 on the right, but you can see it's got purple, red, dark green and light green RNA segments which come from swine viruses of different sorts, human viruses, avian viruses, Eurasian swine, and these reassortments probably happened in various animals over time and you know we can never reconstruct exactly where this happened but you have wild birds and you have swine that are raised for food supply and then you have humans thrown in the mix and so uh, this that virus that emerged in 2009 was an exact product of this sort of reassortment right and we all know how that went with the media portrayal and I think yeah it, it seems that viral reassortment goes hand in hand with pandemics which go hand in hand with media hype and inaccurate reporting and I think that's something that we should definitely talk about and, as well because that's really important that's another should, aspect and right before we get to that you no know, because we it's a big part with the public and I want to do a quick station identification and let people know that you can ask all of us questions here. Um, mm -hmm. If you want to leave any comments on the event page on Google Plus, you can also leave comments on YouTube through any of the shares on Google Plus, or if you're watching us embedded anywhere, you can use Twitter using the hashtag SciSun, HOA. We'll be able to uh, monitor the comments, any questions going on as well, and any relevant links that we'll have for the, the show, we'll be able to place into the YouTube uh, channel after the fact and also into the event page as we're going on. So please feel free to ask us any questions, make any comments, share any stories that you might have had um, and any concerns that it might have come from it because this is something that, effect, uh, that affects all of us that you might hear a story that's concerning and we can actually disseminate what is, is there any actual reason to be concerned with that type of story about these viruses coming through. So anybody hear any good Media stories coming about H five. Actually, I, I just I just want to mention something about the um or we'll discuss something about the reassortment. I take it that this is something that happens in nature all the time anyway. It's just that people don't notice unless you have some kind of a pandemic like what happened with H one N one back in two thousand nine. When something like that happened, it comes into people's mind. But then you might have also other reassortment that end up with viruses that infect, say, other species of bird. It might end up with some kind of pandemic in an animal that is not human, or it might just end up having these failed viruses that, you know, have mutations that do not allow them to infect, you know, a new and different host. And so this is reassortment is something that happens in nature, but we don't always notice it. And the only time anyone notices it is when you have something like the pandemic happening. That's absolutely right. It's going on all the time and we have such high surveillance for influenza that we often pick it up. Uh, there are many, many WHO labs all over the world and what they do is they look in various species for viruses just to sample what's out there and they often pick up novel reassortants. So it happens all the time, every second out there. There's so many infections going on and in humans only becomes a problem when we have a pandemic. And it's, it's worth saying that just getting a reassortant is not enough to make a pandemic virus. It probably has to undergo other changes at the nucleotide level. Just randomly these occur and you get the right combination and the right contact between an animal and a human. You know, you have to have that. That's the key event. You can make all the reassortants and mutants you want, but if the animal that they're occurring in never contacts a human, you will never get a pandemic. And that is why these meat markets, these poultry markets are so important, where you have raw poultry in contact with people. It's a perfect venue for transmitting the viruses. Yeah, it's also good to point out that um, our seasonal flu that we get most years, or that sort of circulates that we normally get, is not 
usually a reassortment. It's usually just um, mutants of, of previously existing flu. So um, what what we're seeing with reassortments is they 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 are the potential to have pandemics um, since there's much less existing immunity in the human population. Right. Okay. Now, what I was saying earlier about some headlines, um, yeah, it's, I, I just went through last week, just going through and just doing a really simple Google search for anyone that want to look for the keywords H5N1 and get some idea about what it means and anything going on about it. And these news articles, it, it makes you think that you're going to need to become a doomsday prepper. Uh, it's, <laughs> or just buy full hazmat gear and never leave your house. Right, exactly. So here's yeah. one, um, and I'm not putting the, the links up right now. I'll put them up at the end of the show so no one goes and gives them a bunch of traffic. But five easy mutations to make bird flu a lethal pandemic. I mean, it sounds like they're giving bomb recipes. And, <laughs> you know, this is something that you're just looking through, and it has looks like a a young child or a woman in the back with an angry chicken in the front you know, <laughs> finding ways of as if it's a very to, angry chicken yes it's a very angry chicken going on <laughs> and you know, seeing something like that you know it, again earlier I'm not a biologist I'm not a virologist and trying to go through and weed through this information and figure out is there something out there that I should be worried about and not everyone has the time to weed through this information and some of these buzzwords, um, here's another one which just blew my mind. And again, if I was just scanning through the newspaper and the quote is anthrax isn't scary at all compared to this. Man-made flu virus with potential to wipe out many millions if it ever escaped is created in research lab. It's, it's horrible. It, it's, <laughs> Coming it's through so bad. as if a bunch of evil scientists are in a bunker somewhere trying <laughs> to find a way to destroy all humans. I think there was a very good line in the movie Contagion, which was like a lot of this relates to you know bioterrorism and stuff like that about how oh, what if the terrorists, whoever they are, got a recipe for making these viruses. Uh, there was a really good line in Contagion, which goes something like you know. We don't need to weaponize this virus. The birds are doing it for us. And That's right. many right. of the infectious agents out there, all these pathogens, they if you want to talk about being weaponized, they are themselves weaponized by nature because they need it for their own survival. And so yeah. evolution, like we, we can't make pathogens better at what they do than what evolution already does for them. This, that's a good point because I've I've wor I have designed viruses for most of my career, and what I've found is that whatever scientists do is always a bit of a mess. Okay, <laughs> because you think, oh, I'm going to introduce this mutation in the virus to allow it to recognize this receptor, and it's usually pretty lousy. So we don't know how to make a virus that would be very effective. Nature does, as you said, Tommy, very well. But humans, any, anytime you put five mutations together in the virus, I will guarantee that it is not going to be terribly virulent in people. Now, I think part of the problem here is that, you know, the press likes sensationalism, and infections and pandemics are what they love. The problem is that they get it wrong. And they, sh I mean, I could understand if they had a fact and they wanted to run with it that was pretty sensational. But that last headline, you know, if it got out, it could kill hundreds of millions of people. That's just plain wrong. Right. And the, the, the people who write the headlines don't seem to get it. Well, it, and I don't you know what to do about like that. Anthrax. When you throw yeah. in anthrax into anything, you are automatically going to get a knee jerk response from anyone reading it. Even though it's a very emotive happens, word after that after it was sure. actually used in bioterrorism right. and trying to equate the two is yeah morally reprehensible I think unfortunately that statement was made by the chairman of the NSABB this government agency in the US that is supposed to review dual use research of concern and I feel that it comes from not really understanding uh, the experiments uh, H5N1 itself seems to be really lethal when you look at the case fatality ratio 
but it has nothing to do with the viruses that were worked on in the laboratories. So this is a real problem. Uh, I don't think it's going to go away. And as you can see, there's been just in the last couple of days a new spate of H5N1 right. uh, headlines because of a new paper coming out of Chinese virology laboratories. And honestly, I, I don't know what to do. I mean, I do a lot to try and combat this kind of nonsense, but it, I, it's a drop in the bucket. Right. I mean, just what you brought up um, in your last sentence here, you know, talking about details of secret experiments on deadly man-made bird flu <laughs> that kills over half of the people it infects will get out, says bioterrorism watchdog. <sighs> this this <laughs> is totally wrong. This is completely wrong. Right. So, it, seeing this, because if I'm going through and wanting to read the news, and, and, and I'm seeing this, I, I wouldn't know any reason why not, especially if it's coming from this, the U.S. National Science Advisory Board of Biosecurity. That sounds, you know, that's a pretty long acronym that I'm having to read through. So they must be knowing what they're talking about, right? And it makes it seem like there's, there's an issue not only with the, the communication. You know, there's a big problem with the communication going on, but there also is an issue of just fundamental understanding of what these terms are meaning and why, you know, most people don't understand transmission vectors. I don't largely understand transmission vectors, and I've tried to study them and mm -hmm. didn't do a good job at it. But, hey, you know, that's why I look up at the stars, because I don't understand things that small. But, you know, n not being able to understand these things and reading this headline and seeing this really prominent person, they're supposed to be a watchdog for biosecurity, and seeing these things come out in the news, the, a layperson has no other choice but to feel terrified, like yeah. the world's going to end tomorrow. Yeah, and it, it hurts research because because of all this drama, because after Ron Fushia's experiment, there was the moratorium that I think it was meant to go on for 60 days at first, but it dragged out for over a year, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, correct. It just ended uh, not too long ago, in fact, right? So wh what exactly is the moratorium? Does that mean they're like, okay, we stop all work on it? Yeah, all the people working on H5N1 uh, transmission, they agreed they wouldn't do any more transmission experiments. Um, until they had come to some agreement about how what kinds of conditions they could be done under. And so the, the U.S. government ended up coming out with a series of guidelines for if you want to do these kinds of experiments with not just H5N1 but a whole list of, of agents including uh, anthrax bacillus and, and uh, Ebola for example. If you want to do these kinds of experiments, transmission experiments, if you want to change the host range, if you want to make a, a drug resistant microbe, then you have to have a plan at your institution for what you would do if things go wrong, if things went bad you know, if it got out and people got infected. And so that's what the, was spent the last year doing to figure out these kinds of plans. And now you can do these experiments again, but you have to have a plan that you file with the government. And that's not easy to do. It's not trivial. But that's a good um, thing, to have that safety. I, I think it's fine. I think it's fine okay. to have a plan. As long as the experiments can go forward, why not have yeah. a plan which says if the, if the organism gets out, what are we going to do about it? You know, we in the lab, we have plans. If you spill a virus on the floor, we have a plan for how to deal with it, right? Yeah. For every level of containment. So it's fine to do that with, with these sorts of dangerous organisms as well. I, I don't have a problem with that. But I think impeding research is not good because this is yeah. work that's meant to help everyone. It's not really, it's yeah. not meant to harm anyone. The people that want to harm us are not publishing their results in, in the journals and going to meetings and talking about them. So is H5N1, um, what category of safety is that? Is it biosafety level 3 or 4? And could you explain it's the difference three. between them? So it is, it is somewhere between 3 and 4. It's not 3. It's a little bit more than 3. It's called is BSL3+. It, is it level plus. pi? So 3.14 maybe? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <Pretty Yeah>. <laughs> I like that. I like that very much. Um, BSL3, BSL you pi. have to... BSO3, you have to have uh, containment suits and masks and, uh, and have certain ways of working. BSL4, which is the highest containment, you have to have negative pressure, filtered air that goes into your suit. And in fact, if anyone is interested in the BSL4, I did a documentary 
uh, on it, which you can find uh, over uh, at my website, virology.ws. So, so the H5 were designed to be a little bit more than three, so not just anyone could do them. Um, and it, see, it works. It, it has not, there's never been any infection, so that's, that's sufficient. And BSL3 plus is okay. Four is impossible. It's very difficult to have a four facility. How many four facilities are there in the world? Are they very few? Um, there are probably less than a hundred, I would say. There's a Wikipedia okay. page where you can look up BSL-4. You'll find every one of them listed where they are. Um, okay. Yeah. I mean, not every country has one, right? So that's yeah. kind of a problem, too. And, and so I think that goes into effect, too. If you, if you have sufficient media hype, if you have people clamoring about something going on and you have to go up to this level four, you are limiting the amount of research that can be done about this virus, about anything going on, what you're trying to learn, and all of a sudden you've been able to efficiently slash what you're able to learn and in the amount of time that you've been able to do because now only a select few of people can even look at it. Sure. Is that is no? That... I, I, for sure. I mean, a BSO four is a bear to work in. I can tell you. I put a suit on and I tried to pipe pet, and it's really hard. You have to have a lot of training, and it's not easy, um, and you're really restricted. And there aren't so many of them, so you can't just say, yeah, I'm at Columbia. There, there's no BSL-4 in New York City, so if I wanted to do these kinds of experiments, I have to go somewhere else. So it's a big impediment, and that's why the, the flu community cried when there were rumors that H5N1 containment was going to go to BSL-4. This is not right. warranted, and it would yeah. really impair our understanding of this virus. Yeah, I ironically, oh, 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 well, I think ironically this would make um, any outbreak of influenza, whether it's H5N1 or any other strain, more dangerous because there are less people there to actually understand it. Yeah. So this hype over having it uh, contained in BSL-4 facilities will limit the research and make us less able to understand a virus yeah. that we really need to un understand. Um, I remember that, um, when I was talking to Will about this, you said that part of the drama with H5N1 was how the Dutch government tried to hold back Ron Fouché's data being published, and they were trying to ban the paper. What can you explain? Yeah, that? that's right. They they used some <laughs> obscure piece of EU law, which <laughs> was meant to prevent the export of terrorist materials. Um, <laughs> no. And so the, this was the journal they were trying to prevent. Um, so the, the paper that they submitted um, to science. Um, and they were actually trying to prevent its export. Um, so mailing now, that, out I, that PDF to someone would have been illegal? Well, I just flew to the States with that paper in my bag. <laughs> How was um, TSA? And I got away. <laughs> I got away. <laughs> TSA didn't give you a pat down for that? <laughs> No. If that's the, if that's the case, there's going to be a lot of migratory birds that are exporting a lot of terrorism. To <laughs> <Yeah. place. laughs> well, then you know they can have that war on Big Bird again. You know how that went last time. <laughs> oh. Oh, oh god! But it, so is is there any reason for you know what's the reason that it's at three now? I mean, obviously you don't put something at three for no reason. And you know I'm trying to play devil's advocate a little bit here. I'm playing okay what. You know, obviously there's an issue here. There's raising enough questions with people, but there's a giant leap from three to four. So what makes it at level three right now? And is that warranted for it to even be at three? Well, H5N1 influenza has, has infected somewhere over 600 people, 600 and some odd confirmed cases, <clears throat> and 60% of them have died. So it's a dangerous virus, and <clears throat> when a virus gets to that level of case fatality, you have to be careful when you work with it. Um, so it's aerosol transmitted, which is part of the issue, uh, and it has the potential to kill. So you want to minimize exposure. You can't have people working on it in the lab in a BSL-2, which would be the next one down, where you could have the potential to make aerosols and inhale them. So that's why it's at a BSL-3. Okay. Um, and, and it's you don't need a four uh, because it's it's not a it's not a known or proven human pathogen in, in the sense that it doesn't go from person to person and it wouldn't start an outbreak for example if it if it got out of the laboratory 
Right. So it's around 600 people and 7 billion people on the, on the planet have, have got it. Do we know how they, they were able to be infected by that? Well, the idea is the, the idea is that most of them had some contact with poultry. Uh, the uh, poultry can be infected with the virus, and uh, you know if you're if you're holding a chicken that's infected, you're going to inhale quite a bit of virus, and it will infect you. Uh, you know, 600 people is not a lot in 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 the billions and billions in the world, and in fact, the 2009 H1N1 pandemic killed many more people than have been killed by uh, H5. It's just the potential for greater uh, lethality, which is worrying people. And it's it's fine to worry about it, but uh, don't worry to the point that you paralyze yourself and you don't do any research. Right. I mean, 60% is, you know, is quite a large amount. I mean, it's not something we, we don't want to mitigate loss to saying, well, it's only 600 people. That's, you know, those are Someone's well, let's important. let's but. let's get. That's a good point. So, sixty percent is the case fatality ratio, which means we have six hundred some odd confirmed WHO confirmed cases, and of those, you know, sixty percent have died. There is some evidence that there may be many more infections that occur out there in the wild that are not lethal, and we don't have a good handle on that. You know, some serological surveys have been done looking for antibodies in people's blood, which could be interpreted to mean that there are a lot of people that are infected with the virus that don't get sick. I think this is a really important question to address, which hasn't been, and it could lower that rate much, much more, okay? So that's the mitigating circumstance there. And, and yeah, and so like you're saying, being paralyzed in fear, not willing to go out and try to find that information, having to jump through so many hoops to do further research on it, we're keeping ourselves ignorant on what you know if even if it is that bad you know worst case scenario it's bad well we're also tying our hands behind our back and telling okay well you still have to pipette but now you have to do it in the suit like this yeah. and it's just mm -hmm. not going to work that you know, work out that well so i, I think in, and maybe this is because I, I used to work emergency services i know instant command and how you you need to know what your risks are going into something, but you also need to be able to utilize your resources the most effective way possible to mitigate loss. And you know, if if you don't, you know, if you don't find ways to prevent further loss, you're like, oh well, you know, we're just going to play it safe over here, and I'm not going to send people into this fire to save it. Well, now you have five other houses burning down because you didn't want to risk the lives of a couple people to go fight it. So there, you have some risk management going on, and sometimes people just jump onto this thing where it's terrifying, and it's really easy to be terrified when you don't have all the facts. Yeah, and it's not just the public that can be ignorant, because there are scientists who can be rational too. Scientists are not immune from irrationality. I remember when I was doing my undergrad, um, one of my um, one of my friends, she was on the course. She refused to eat chicken because she thought she'd get bird flu from it. And I was like, that's not how it works. And we just had a virology class. Do you not connect the two? Because you have people who go to class and they do the science, but then it's, for them, science is a nine to five job. They switch off, and all the irrash irrationality comes in after that. And I think that's why hangouts like this and talking helps people be scientific, not just for certain times, but their whole lives, and I think that's a good thing. Yeah, I think the idea of being afraid in science doesn't work. You have to take whatever it is that's important and just work on it. The fear will will totally impede progress. So if you're afraid of H5N1, this is this is crazy. You always have to balance. I think the benefit versus the risk. And I think in the discussion over this particular virus, that wasn't really done effectively. You know, one of the things about science is sometimes you don't know why it's going to be important, right? Why, why whatever your data are going to be important. But you just have to do it. There's a lot of serendipity involved. But the people who balance the pros and cons of H5 research don't take that into account. They don't understand that, yeah, we have these five mutations. We're not sure what they mean today, but maybe in, in five years we'll really get it. So you can't forget the how, how science works when you're, when you're working with something dangerous like this. Absolutely. 
So I'm going to go through some of the comments here. Um, and actually, David asked you, Vincent. It says, um, that ben, or actually, it just Vincent said that chimpanzees aren't the best non-human model for flu because the respiratory tracts behave differently. It's coincidence then that ferrets are susceptible like humans, or have ferrets converged independently onto humans' breathing systems? I, I would say it's coincidence. You know, you you could probably look at many many other animals and find one that that might be better, but this is the one that was uh, that was found to work. It's you know it's good enough. Uh, the, uh, there's no, as far as I know, and maybe the evolutionary biologist here should comment. That I don't know of any convergence. Yeah. Uh, uh, you, you often have these uh, coincidences that does not necessarily relate to phylogeny. So, for example, Xenopus, which is the African claw frog, they used to be transported around the world, and they are actually used as uh, contraception tests. So, if you get urine from a woman that you want to know whether she's pregnant or not and then you get that urine and then you put it in the same tank with uh, some xenopus. If the xenopus starts spawning and laying eggs, that means that she's pregnant. Now, it doesn't mean that this frog is you know, closely related to human. It's just by some quirk of uh, physiology and biochemistry that means that there's this crossover. So uh, often in many laboratory experiments, there are certain model animals and Model, uh, model animals are used for specific properties that they have that does not necessarily reflect the phylogeny or relationship with uh, the particular animals that you want them to serve as models for. So that's why you have fruit flies, that's why you have nematode worms that serve as models uh, for a wide range of organisms, but that doesn't mean that you know, something that we find out in fruit mm -hmm. fly that might be applicable to humans means that we're closely related at all. So a good example, my wife works uh, on hypertension at a drug company. And do you know what the best uh, animal for studying hypertension in humans is? It's a rabbit. <laughs> so go figure. Is it because they both like tricks? or <laughs> Carrots. 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 Oh, that was true. I, I, I do like carrots. <laughs> no, you... Yeah, we've, we've mentioned too, this is not just something that came up in 2011 and we've had to kind of battle with. I know um, I was talking to you earlier, Vincent, that we're now able to research this again in the United States. So it's you know past the 60-day moratorium and, we, and the U.S. actually held on to it a little bit further than that. But now there's other, other strains coming out that, you know, in, in China and a big reason to be aware of the media and also what is actually happening. Um, would any of you three like to chime in on any of the news happening and what we should, you know, what we should be aware of and not, you know, be concerned for, but also, you know, be a little skeptical about being concerned for. Well, well it's a, go ahead, Tommy. Oh, um, I just noticed just in the days leading up to the hangout was, of course, I think the experiment we alluded to where it was the reassortment experiment with H1N1 and H5N1. And once again, we get the same kind of headlines about, you know, scientists making this super deadly flu that could turn into a pandemic and the usual kind of headline that you could almost rip it from back in 2011 and swap yeah. it and we're we'll looking at It's so predictable stuff. and it's st yeah. already starting to roll in and I see a lot of it on Google Plus as well. There's a lot of fear mongering by social media virologists <laughs> talking about these things. So, yeah, I think that's why it's really important that we say what it is, and this is what the science is. I, 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 think, I think it's worth pointing out, out this. Oh, um, oh, Vincent, your mic is going off again. again. I'll pull it, yeah. I'll pull it out. Yep. Okay. <laughs> so, while Vincent does that, how about you, Will? Have you heard anything new going on in virology with the crazy Chinese flus happening all over the place? Yeah, well, I found that actually quite surprising. So what they did is they made a reassortment of all those eight gene segments that um, Vincent was talking about the flu have. So they made all the possible combinations, which was 127 different combinations. Um, and then they looked to see which ones of those were transmissible. Um, they did that in guinea pigs. Um, having gone on about how good ferrets is, I'm not quite sure why they chose uh, guinea pigs, but they did, um, and they found some strains, some reassortments that were transmissible. So it, it tells us 
it, yeah, it tells us that we that there there is the potential here again for a reassortment where we we might get a, a, a mammalian transmissible virus. But when we're saying there's a chance, what what are we meaning by a chance? I mean, is is this something where where you know the the Hollywood movies are going to be? Is know, it an eventuality? No, and we can't quantify that chance in any way. All we can say is it's possible. Uh, whereas before that, we said we didn't know. Um, so, yeah, that, that, that's all we can say, and that's all that this study shows. Um, we, we don't know what the sort of the numbers are, what the multipliers are, how often you're getting these reassortments, and and all the rest of it. And also whether the guinea pig model would actually um, work out into um, would would have the same effect in humans. Yeah, actually, was it a re was there a reason why they used guinea pig in this case instead of say uh, ferrets like in the previous experiments? I'm I'm not sure that they explain why they use guinea pigs. Um, they, they 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 cite some some papers where they they say that uh, the virulence is is well correlated with guinea pigs to to uh, with humans. Um, I, I, I don't know why they didn't choose ferrets. Maybe it's uh, an expense. Um, I, I'm not sure. Maybe can Vincent, you, you know. Can you guys hear me now? Yep. Yes. Yeah. You're perfect. Guinea, yeah. guinea pig is a good model for transmission. Um, you can put it, put guinea pigs next to each other in cages, and the virus will travel uh, through the air from one to the other. So that's why we're using it, and a number of other. Um, studies have been done using it as a transmission model, so I think that's the, the logic there. Okay. Right. Very good. Well, I, I do have another um, comment here from from David, and actually asked a really good question that we can actually can uh, leave with. Is um, you know, the mainstream media is failing to educate the public, but moreover, it's sometimes miseducating the public. Um, he's complimenting our our hangout, but also that blogs and websites, textbooks, and all many other things are trying to compensate. Are there any sites that any of you guys would, would recommend to help the layperson educate themselves, not only on you know, this topic as far as flu, but also virology, microbiology, any sort of diseases or any resources out there that would help get pertinent information that a layperson can at least understand to a certain level and can dig deeper if they choose to? Well, um, I know he's here, but Vincent's blog and um, TWIV website is uh, is an excellent place, and I know a lot of friends who are not virologists who, who listen to that, um, and there, there's there's a lot of other material on there as well, which a lot of information about individual viruses. Um, I, I would recommend going there. I didn't pay him to say that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can no, pay me later. You, you're paying them afterwards, <laughs> right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Tom, yeah I, I, is there any any more that you you get a lot of your information, or where you're you point people to besides your own place where you? Because you're everyone. You know, I know everyone here is very passionate about uh, discussing and sharing out this information with the public, and so we 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 tend to stick together and and support one another, and not only share what we what we put out, but what other groups put out as well that we think is, is good. Uh, there, there are a couple of sites that I go to. On my, on my blog, virology.ws, I have a little blog roll on the lower right-hand side of the page, which I call useful sites. And there, there's one other virus site I go to a lot. It's called Rule of Six. It's written by a virology graduate student in uh, Belfast. So that's quite a good place. Uh, Small Things Considered is a really good site about microbiology. That's an so, awesome name. I, yeah, I love that, that title. <laughs> uh, so those are, those are two really good places that I go as well. I also think sciencebasedmedicine.org is a really good site. That's quite a, it's a group of um, scientists and clinicians who um, write about these controversial right. topics. There's a lot of debunking going on. I haven't really seen them cover virology that much, but they do talk a lot about cancer um, you know, pseudoscience, mm -hmm. cancer square, uh, scares, anti-vaccination movements, uh, vitamin supplements, and things like that. So I really love sciencebasedmedicine.org. That's something I would recommend. Well, I guess Will and uh, Vincent already 
mentioned the site that I quite like. I rather like reading uh, Small Things Considered as well. And um, just another plug to Vincent is, of course, Microbe World, which covered the whole conglomerate of this week in virology, this week in microbiology, and this week in parasitism. Uh, I myself write a blog that um, that's not really covered or, or no longer really covered a human infecting parasites, but it's about presenting parasites in a way from, I guess, the light of the ho whole horror B movie that most people think of. That you know, parasites are just like any other living things. It's just that they live in an environment that's very different from what we're familiar with as free living organisms. But they're not always out to get you. They are yeah. like any other living thing. And in terms of science media, I found that another really good site is the Night Science Journalism Tracker. And they do uh, these blog entries on how different news story or, or different science story are covered by different news media. So that's a really good resource, uh, Night Science Journalism. So Night with a K. <laughs> Yeah, I'm actually collecting all these links and putting them into the event page. So um, this is MIT, right? I was about to say that. <laughs> already on it very good so again you know thank you you guys for for showing up and trying to shed some light on there with it is there any recommendations for, besides trying to go out and educate yourself but when when reading headlines like the ones that we've gone over today and others that are, you know i only shared a few i had a bunch of bookmarks on there that went in there so there's a lot of it's out there is there anything that you would recommend to people when reading something like this to be able to differentiate between something that's serious and something that might be trying to get a little more page views and, may, and maybe not even anything nefarious. Maybe they just didn't quite understand the original primary sources coming out and this is how they interpret it and it's being sent out to the public. Is there anything that you guys would recommend to keep from being I think. I think it's actually really hard to distinguish um, and I think that's what the real problem is here is that we have things that look exactly like real scare stories and real reasons to be alarmed. Um, I don't know if, as a lay person, you could discriminate. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 go on, listen. I think it's very hard, and one thing that could help is to find scientists who are willing to answer your questions, because they are the ones that know the field the best. You know, I try and. and answer every email and comment that I get and uh, you you can go to some of these sources and some people will do that if you leave a comment they'll answer it or if you even send them an email I think that's really crucial and that will help engage more of the scientific community as well which is really important to do and there are certain outlets which are notorious for having bad you know, daily mail for example um, there are certain more tabloidy kind of news outlet which are very much known for having these sensationalist headlines. Um, so always check check the credentials of the people who are doing you know doing the writing, doing the talking. But at the same time, keep in mind to get you know multiple opinion on certain things. And knowing that um, a particular scientist, uh, especially, and this kind of relates to the whole climate change science that. Uh, if, yeah. let's say, you're going to talk about viruses, a virologist is most likely to be the person who knows best. Um, someone outside of that particular field, say someone who is a meteorologist, might not you know, be able to give you an entirely accurate picture because they're outside of that field. Right, right. Yeah, I will not claim to be in this panel because I know anything about vir <laughs> virology, but hopefully trying to you know, underline the fact that science communication is crucial to not only the, those of us that love science communication, we, I, we are very passionate about sharing science, but we do it not just because we're a bunch of nerds, we do it because we believe that it really will help our species not only survive, but also better understand the universe that we live in, no matter what scale that we're at. And when we're able to make just more informed decisions about the environment we're living in, and where we can go in the future with it, whether we should be terrified of that viruses are out trying to kill us, or the fact that these are organisms that have been around for billions and billions of years, that, you know, it's not all that bad. You know, it, it's something that they're, they're, 
we're the we're the new creature on the scene, and we're we're kind of doing a lot of things here on this planet. And there's many other species on this planet, and not everything's trying to kill us. But maybe we should you know, just be a little bit more respectful of what we're about and understand that when we put ourselves in, into bad situations, sometimes bad things are going to happen. I don't go play around lava pits because I might get hurt. I, <laughs> I do sometimes. I know you do. <laughs> uh, the, the thing that I always say to students and other people when it comes to parasites and uh, infectious organisms is that, uh, look, don't be so vain. It's not all about you. They're not mm -hmm. all out to trying to infect human. They're perf some of them perfectly happy of doing their own thing, going through their own life cycles, and they might do things that even indirectly benefit ourselves and our environment. It's just that yeah. they're not all out to get you. So don't be too paranoid and wrap yourself <laughs> up in a bubble and thinking yeah. that everything's out there to get you. Yeah. Well, that's great. So, um, yeah, we've, we've reached the end of our show here today. Um, I wanted to thank, you know, Tommy. Thank you again for showing up. Um, Vincent, for Thanks. coming back from, from last week's show. Well, Tommy and, came back, too. We had Tommy a few. We have had Tommy. Ago. And yeah. we'll, keep, we'll keep everyone coming back because yeah. we're greedy. <laughs> but, um, and then Will, even though you're at a conference, uh, thank you for... Yeah, thank up. you so much for taking the time to, yeah. Is there anywhere you're online welcome. that people can find you, Will? Um, <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> well, then you should start posting. You should plus, yeah? start, yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll see what I can do about that. I'll start strong-arming him. All right, guys. <laughs> um, Vincent, how about you? Where can, where can more people find you? Well, people, you can find uh, my writings and all my podcasts at my website, virology.ws. And there you can find links to This Week in Virology, for example. If you're really curious about viruses, check it out. And I will answer uh, all of your questions. Um, and there you can also find a link to my undergraduate virology lectures, which you might find interesting uh, okay. to learn the basics about viruses. And your YouTube channel was very useful as well when I was doing homework for <laughs> our hangout. <laughs> Excellent. Tommy, how about you? Where can uh, you, can, you can find me on Google Plus, of course. Uh, you can also find me on Twitter at the underscore Episiarch. Uh, I also write the blog, The Daily, uh, Daily Parasite, or Parasite of the Day. Uh, it's not quite Parasite of the Day. It was in the first year. Uh, mm -hmm. Now I only get time to write maybe two entries per month, but uh, they're always new and different things that you know, teach you more about how parasites live and how they get around in their world. Awesome. Well, again, this concludes our, our weekly Science Sunday Hangout on Air. I'm Scott Lewis from NovaCosmos.com, the bald astronomer on Twitter. I am all over Google Plus and CosmoQuest and Astrosphere New Media. Um, but yeah, we, we're, we like to have a lot of fun here um, on Google Plus. So thank you, everyone out, out here. My co host, Budini, where can more people find about you? Um, I. I can help curate Science Sunday, so if you have any posts about science, please tag it with hashtag Science Sunday, and we will be um, sharing out the science like that. I also write about science on my own personal profile, and you can find me on Twitter sometimes at Dr. Half Pint Buddy. Yeah, you can thank me for that internet. I named. Yeah. I made up that one. Yeah, it's That's true. Great. You came up with that name. <laughs> All right. Well, again, thank you, everyone, and we will see you guys later. Thank you.